I've spoken to people who have been much more involved with the 360 series than I have. I'm, I'm a complete charlatan. I've written a few Fortran programs that ran on top of System 360. But people who I've been in contact with now say, we admired it a lot for its achievements, but it was not not a user-friendly or programmer-friendly environment. I've not found anybody who is prepared to stand up and say, yeah, it was the bee's knees, it was wonderful. They all said, yeah, it was a bit of a mishmash. Some really good things in it, some things that were awful to cope with. Didn't they think about writing it in a higher level language? Wouldn't that have got better productivity? Because, of course, this is all in assembler. So what would the story be then about trying to use a higher level language? And at this era, I mean, I do have a little bit of hands-on knowledge, not so much on the 360 series, but on the ICL 1906, where the ICL provided software didn't let me do this, but Algol 68 compiler written for the RCL 1906A did enable me to do it, is to, yeah, just be able to use the higher level language for things like if statements or case statements, things involving layouts and just, and also, of course, to have the higher level language be capable of working out for square arrays or rectangular arrays which scientists and engineers love but as we all know they're not held in a square format directly or a rectangular format you have to work out in a linear apparently linear level of memory where exactly is byte number a55 that's holding this character i'm interested in and you have to do multiplication sums you have to know how many bytes there are in each of these objects in your array. You have to know whether the underlying architecture is storing the array by rows or storing it by columns. Now, interestingly, at Bell Labs, before Dennis and Ken invented C, can you guess what Ken Thompson's chosen high-level language was? I will say at the outset that his first stab at anything was to write an interpreter for it in the B language. Very cut down BCPL. I, I'm guessing just because of what you've just said, Fortran. Yes. The number <laughs> of times that. that Ken, in those very early days, says, oh yes, and once we've done that, we must do a Fortran compiler. Fortran can be amazingly spartan and minimalist in its approach. But if you're struggling to find a language that will just about do as a system programming language and nothing else is available, I know from experience I've done mixed Fortran and assembler programming. So long as the people writing the link editor get the assembler modules talking to the Fortran modules okay, it can be remarkably effective. Effective. What does a compiler do with the assembler when you've got a mixed language? Like the as far as the compiler knows, you write a procedure call, a subroutine call out for a subroutine called Fred, with parameters A, B, and C. Little does the Fortran compiler know that the thing that will merge this into a uniform thing is that Fred is written in assembler. And the rules on the assembler manual say, we can help you if you will only pass your actual parameters in registers five, six, and seven, shall we say. You follow that, then we, the link editor for assembler level modules, and that's the thing in the end, the Fortran compiles down to being assembler level modules. They all get linked in a uniform and harmonious way because there are agreed conventions for how you pass information between the two. The thing that really gets you in vanilla early Fortran was it helped enormously with the logic, the if and the case statements. You could do them as it were although Fortran didn't have case at the time, but uh, doing array calculations and getting that right, what it couldn't do then in most Fortrans was actual detailed bit twiddling, you know, masking with 
bit patterns. That typically had to be saved for assembler and addressed at the end of a known interface as to how you pass your eight bits across to be twiddled with or whatever. So we've now mentioned the fact that if you wanted a slightly higher level approach then Fortran could come to your rescue. If you wanted something better than that, wouldn't these more modern languages, um, PL1 if you were an IBM disciple, Algol 68 if you were a weirdo committee person that just loved high level languages, wouldn't they be even more helpful? And the answer to that is it depended on the implementation. If I had to pull out one more anecdote of high level language constructs that eventually became house trained and became visible in Dennis and Ken's early C, it was structures. Now in arrays, you don't really name, well you give the array an overall name, but the rest of your calculations as to where the elements are is all done by multiplying, because they're all rectangular or square, you can work it out. But what you really need <clears throat> is something, agglomerations where they're not all the same size objects, structures in other words. You need to be able to name the fields or components in your structure and have them be at different boundaries depending on whether it's a set of reals or a set of characters or a set of integers. You need to be able to name things. And I'm told by psychologists that this is a very deep psychological need in the human brain. You've got to be able to give things names. And significantly, Ken is, was more or less saying it was fourth time lucky. By the time we got structures properly working, you knew that if you did underscore Fred, it knew how many bytes displacement the beginning of Fred was from the start of the beginning of the whole structure. And you didn't have to think, oh, is it 10 bytes ahead? the tables you were building up as you compiled it told you that by counting and dead reckoning the field called Jim had to be exactly 12 bytes downstream of the start. So if you say thing underscore Jim you got it right but if you actually moved on by what you thought was the right number of bytes you'd get off by one problems. No, it wasn't 10 bytes down, it was 11 bytes down. But if you name, if you extend the labelling system to be the principle of naming things, you start getting things right. And he said that was the key in early C. If you give them names and you label them and let the compiler make its own memo of how far down these fields are within each of these structures as you declare and instantiate them, it will get it right for so you. So it's getting higher level effect. Well, yes, it's just so simple. But what Ken is covertly saying is even genius programmers like me make mistakes. And the way to stop making mistakes is to have a labeling scheme and just trust it. So it's another part of something we might want to get onto in another video is to what degree is it advantageous in programming to hide things? And in a way, giving things names is hiding the ultimate hardware truth from you. Procedure interfaces is another way of forcibly hiding things, you know. I'm not going to have you replicate and squirt out all my raw assembler. I'm going to get you to jump into one of my procedures and I will tell you which registers in the CPU to use for passing over extra information and you will trust that procedure. And as we get even further on into agglomerations of procedures and arrays and structs that develop into an even bigger class thing in object-oriented languages, even more so does it apply that being able to name things and from the concatenation of the names being able to work out where the heck that object is in real memory is absolutely vital to go over here across the distributed shared memory link to get the value and then we could bring the value back so rather than taking 100 nanoseconds it would take in the order of 300 nanoseconds. For most people if they've never created a branch before that just shows you the main branch that you're currently on and it will have a star next to it because that's the one it's showing you.